Well, I appreciate the uh, <clears throat> presence of everyone here tonight. Had a very good lesson from James Arline, uh, one that uh, we all ought to take to heart. <clears throat> but we're in a study of Romans, and last week we finished with chap uh, uh, verse 12 of chapter 7, so we'll start with verse 13 of uh, chapter 7 tonight. Before we do, though, let's have a, a short word of prayer. Would you bow with me, please? Heavenly Father, we pray that will bless the study of thy word and we're grateful for the truths that are contained therein for our ability to access that truth. We pray, Father, as we learn it, we may put it into practice and that we may be stubborn for the truth, never wavering from it, either to the right or to the left. And we're grateful for the example that Christ left us that regardless of the circumstances of this life, he was always obedient to thy will. May we do likewise. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, we uh, uh, left off verse 12. It said, therefore, the law is holy and the commandments holy, just and good, just and good. And then he goes on to say in verse 13, Has then what is good become death to me? Of course, he answers very emphatically in the negative, certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. So the, the, the phrase, what is good, uh, that is the commandment. What is good is the commandment. In the verse 10, Paul wrote, And the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. In verse 11, he wrote, For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. The commandment uh, was found to end in death because those who broke it incurred its penalty. It was sin that deceived and killed. The law was designed to prevent sin and therefore identified it and warned against it. <clears throat> in no sense was it responsible for sin, so the reply, certainly not. It is through the commandment that the true nature of sin is revealed. Sin in whatever form or however manifested produces death. But the commandment, uh, which is good and holy, in identifying sin and providing opportunity for Satan to appeal to man's passions, produced death. But Satan, in working death by the opportunity provided by the commandment, which is good, showed sin to be enormously uh, sinful. Verse 14, Paul wrote, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Uh, spiritual is being contrasted with carnal. Law is spiritual, and therefore law makes an appeal to the spiritual side of man, or the, the spirit of man, if you will. The law commands what is right and forbids what is wrong. <clears throat> spiritual and carnal, as used here, are both uh, Greek uh, nominative. Therefore, it could be said that spiritual is the law and carnal am I. Paul says that he is carnal. Now this is Paul, the, the Christian, that's saying this. He has been redeemed by the blood of Christ, but yet he says that he is carnal as opposed to the spiritual of the law sold under sin. Being in the flesh, uh, although pardoned from his sins, he is still subject to the passions of the flesh and will never be entirely free from them while in the flesh. When he talks of being sold under sin, he's alluding to a slave 
sold to a master. He is not totally obedient, obedient to sin, but as long as he is in the flesh, he is still subject to it to a certain extent, as is the slave to his master. He, as any Christian would, struggles against sin, not being 100% successful in his avoidance. The best and worst seem powerless to abstain from it entirely, but the Christian does not habitually practice it, whereas the unredeemed do. In verse 15, Paul goes on to say, for what I am doing, I do not understand. Now the King James, it says, I do not, I allow not. ASP says, I know not. But the New King James says, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. For what I hate, that I do. <clears throat> We have a nature in, within and a nature without that are at times at odds with one another. The Christian, if he's a faithful Christian, always wants to do what is right, but sometimes obeys this and sometimes that. The phrase, <clears throat> for what I am doing, I do not understand is uh, rendered uh, differently in the three versions, you know, New King James, King James, and ASV. <clears throat> uh, Thayer renders it to say, I do not understand what I am doing. My conduct is inexplicable to me. <clears throat> in the complete uh, word study dictionary, the, uh, of course, this is the online version with the idea of volition of goodwill it's talking about uh, I do not understand it's with the idea of volition of goodwill to know and approve or love to care for <clears throat> as in Romans 7 15 which we're considering right now that which I do I do not know its uh, meaning is I do not approve or as a King James Version says, or has it, allow not. Well, if we were to paraphrase this, Paul is saying that I do not approve the things of the flesh that I am doing. I wish to practice the very thing that the law requires, but I do not practice it unfailingly. For being in the flesh, I am sometimes led by it, that is, passions of the flesh to sin and I hate that verse 16 uh, it says there if then I do what I will not to do I agree with the with the law that it is good <clears throat> so every time he commits a sin he does so against what he wants to do as a Christian in doing so, he agrees with the law that he should not commit the sin. Therefore, the law is good. In verse 17, he goes on to write, But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. It is the uh, passions of sin which excite the flesh to commit the sin. If left to himself, unmoved by the passions of the flesh, he would do only what he willed to do, which is what the law requires. So in a sense or in a manner of speaking, it is sin, or rather sinful passions, that temp tempts one living in the flesh to do what he wills not to do. In verse 18, it reads, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. <clears throat> so the will to do good is present, uh, but the uh, flesh interferes. 
sinful passions dwell in the flesh, then sin acts through those sinful passions. Now, nothing good dwells in unfettered passions. Therefore, passions must be controlled. Flesh, uh, being what it is, seeks after its own gratification. It never demands abasement or sacrifice to some higher purpose. It is the will of man, the inner man, operating under the influence of the gospel, that controls the appetites of the flesh. <clears throat> the desires and appetites of the flesh serve a purpose, and God will not take them away. They are subject to man's will for good or for evil. If the passions of the flesh are the master, then no way may be found for the flesh to perform what is good, that is, what the law demands. Then the law, in that circumstance, can only punish. That's all it can do. <clears throat> in uh, verse uh, 19, for the good that I will to do, I do not. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. <clears throat> so the good, quote unquote, uh, comprehends all the good that a Christian wants to do, and that characterizes the faithful service to his Lord and fellow man. But he fails to do all good because of the imposition of the flesh. The faithful Christian wills not to do any evil. Evil uh, here comprises all that is evil. The faithful Christian does not practice all that is evil. He rejected that uh, when he rendered obedience to Christ. The faithful Christian does not habitually practice evil of any kind, but uh, being in the flesh occasionally commits sin. So that is the evil, it says, I will not to do. But I practice it, not by habit, but occasionally because of human weakness. <clears throat> in verse 20, now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Now, this uh, provides emphasis to verses 16 and 17, which we just covered. If I do what I will not to do, then clearly I am acting against my will. So what is it that compels me to act against my will? It must be something that overpowers the will. It is the sin that dwells in me. Sin, as used here, is a personification of the power of the fleshly passions that dwells in the body. <clears throat> The power of the fleshly passions is so great that when they are excited, it forces me to gratify them and therefore I sin. This is all the more reason to keep those passions under control. In verse 21, it says, I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. Law is a uh, um, it's a force in, or influence impelling one to action. And that's from the Abbott Smith uh, manual, Greek lexicon, lexicon of the New Testament. So a Christian always wants to do good, yet find, <clears throat> finds an evil force or influence uh, within him since he is in the flesh, which evil force or influence excites him or his, his uh, passions, excites him to sin. For I delight in the law according to the inward man in, in verse 22. So why does one will 
to do good. And uh, this is the answer to that question. That Christian is always wishing to do good. It is prompted by his delight in the requirements of the law. Every requirement is agreeable and divine to him. The wish to keep these requirements is profound and it disturbs him greatly when he fails to keep them. It is the inward man that perceives and appreciates uh, that is his spiritual nature rather than, than his physical nature. In verse uh, 23, but I see another law in my members, warring against my law, against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. The other law, quote unquote, is uh, another law, is different than the quote unquote, the law of God in which I delight in the preceding verse. My members, quote unquote, is the flesh. But here is referenced each part as a totality. The law which he sees in his members is the constant tendency to sin, which he notices in them whenever excited by fleshly passions. This uh, tendency is called a law. Paul is here concerned about the fact of the tendency rather than the specific causes. The quote-unquote law of my mind is his constant inclination to do what is right, or at the very least, to do what one quote-unquote ought to do. In the Christian, the fleshly tendency to do evil and, and the mental inclination to do right are constantly at war with one another. <clears throat> man is not <clears throat> necessarily brought into permanent captivity by the law of fleshly passions leading to sin otherwise the law of man could never overcome sin yet man while in this tabernacle of flesh is always subject to the influences of the fleshly passions and at times he yields to its satisfaction it may be said then that he is captive sometimes in its realization and is captive always to its potential. In verse 24, Paul says, Oh, wretched, uh, that's unhappy, uh, lamentable, uh, spiritual or emotional misery, that's being wretched. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? But he's miserable, unhappy, uh, miserable because of the war between the law in his members and the law of his mind. The body of death is the law in his members, which, if delivered uh, from it, results in the end of this warfare. Who then will deliver him? In verse 25, he says, I thank God, and we could add there, he will deliver us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So that's who's going to do the delivering. So then, <clears throat> with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So Jesus Christ is going to uh, deliver him. Paul, with this mind that is inner man, serves the law of God. That is, he, he obeys the law of God. The law of God is his expressed will. That's God's expressed will, which is now in the gospel and in precepts, the old law as well. Romans 15, chapter 15, verse 4. Paul is not saying that he serves both the law of God and the law of sin at the same time. He, as well as we, cannot serve the law of sin continually and remain faithful. 
Therefore, sin must be only occasional and acceptive. Then it is that we serve the law of sin with the flesh and not with the mind. And in uh, starting uh, ver uh, chapter 8, verse 1, There is now, therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And this uh, last phrase here is the same as in verse uh, 4, uh, to come later. This last phrase is not in the ASV version, because uh, the Nestle-Land lexicon doesn't have it, and the Texas Receptus lexicon does, uh, but it doesn't change the meaning of it. The provisions of the gospel are such that for those who are in Christ Jesus, and that is those who have obeyed from the heart the gospel of Jesus Christ, Romans uh, 6 verse 17, there is now no ground for condemnation. Those who do not walk according to the flesh may sin occasionally, but when they repent, they will be forgiven. And it remains still that there is no ground for condemnation. One must be in Christ for there to be no condemnation, and one must be baptized to be in Christ. In Galatians, the third chapter, verse 27, we read, For as many as you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Once in Christ, uh, there the uh, Christian must remain. And we have this uh, phrase, uh, walk. Uh, walk according to the flesh. And it's, it's used throughout the... Uh, Certainly, the New Testament it's used a number of times, so it's you know it's good to have a good understanding of how the New Testament uses the word walk. So, from the New Unger's Bible Dictionary again, the online version, uh, they have this definition. So, walk is often used in Scripture as a in a figurative sense for conduct in life general demeanor uh, and deportment. Thus it is said that Enoch and Noah walked with God. That is, they maintain a course of action conformed to God's will and acceptable in his sight. In the Old Testament and New Testament, we find God promising to walk with his people. And his people, on the, on the other hand, desiring the influence of the Holy Spirit that they may walk in his statutes. To walk in darkness, 1 John 1, verse 6, is to be involved in unbelief and misled by error. To walk in the light, same chapter, verse 7, is to be well informed, holy, and happy. To walk by faith, 2 Corinthians 5, chapter, verse 7, may be rendered through faith we walk. That is, uh, faith is the, the uh, sphere through which we walk. To walk according to the flesh, uh, Romans 8, chapter, verse 4, we get that in a moment. And you can cross-reference uh, Second Peter, second chapter, verse 10. So to walk according to the flesh is to gratify the carnal desires, to yield to fleshly appetites, and to be obedient to the lusts of the flesh. While to walk by the Spirit, Galatians 5th chapter verse 16, is to be guided and aided, aided by the Holy Spirit, the active and the animating principle of the Christian life. And we know that the uh, uh, Holy Spirit uh, works through the uh, sword of the spirit that is the the word that has been left to us in the gospel <clears throat> in verse 2 of chapter 8 
uh, for the law. And I want to point out some of the Greek uh, uh, definitions here or, or uh, senses for the law that, that is in the Greek, a noun, masculine, it's singular, and it's nominative, it's naming something. So, uh, or denominating something, law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from sin. And uh, the law has made me free from sin. That's the, uh, the nominative of the law. Law has made me free from sin. And uh, Well, I think of it, it's made me free from law. The law has made me, uh, law of the spirit has made me free from the, uh, just from the law. And the second law is noun, masculine, singular, and genitive. And genitive means it's pointing to the law of something. Here's the law of sin and death. So the law of the spirit, it's uh, nominating something, naming something. That law has made me free from the second law, which is the law of sin and death. So it is the spirit of life located in Christ Jesus that frees us from the law of sin and death. But uh, what is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus? In John the sixth chapter, verse 63, we read, it is the spirit who gives life. The fresh uh, flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. So the law of the spirit is contained in the words of the spirit, that is the gospel. In 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, verse 13, it reads there, These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So it's the Holy Spirit teaching words. And the words are contained in the gospel. <clears throat> So the law of sin and death is not the law of, uh, of my members that we read about in, in the uh, chapter 7, verse 23, which is warring with the law of my mind. Since the law of my members remains with us while we are in this tabernacle of flesh with its desires, yielding to the law in my members delivers one to the law of sin and death which uh, results in spiritual death. The law of sin and death is the law that punishes sin with death and nothing more. You sin, you die. Not physically, but uh, spiritually. I'm sure there's some sins that you commit uh, physically is going to result in your physical death, but that's not what this is talking about. So this is what the uh, law of Moses did. It could not save, nor could any pure law system. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, which is the gospel, frees one from the penalty of death, provided one is obedient to its call. So the law as used here and uh, wherever else used uh, with respect to the gospel troubles those who wish to remove the concept of law from Christianity and make it a system of faith only. I have here a definition of law by Thayer's. Uh, it's anything established, anything received by usage, a custom, usage, law, a command, uh, law. It's used of any law whatsoever, as in Romans 3rd chapter, verse 27. 
it's used of the Mosaic law and referring according to the context either to the volume of the law or its uh, content, uh, contents uh, with the article. And you can look at Matthew 5.18 to see that. It could uh, refer to the law of the Christian religion, the law demanding faith. Again, Romans 3rd chapter, verse 27. Uh, by autonomy, the name of the more important part in for example, of Pentateuch is put for the entire collection of the sacred books. Autonomy is where one part stands for the whole, or what uh, the whole stands for the part. Um, and you look at John 7th chapter, verse 49 to, to see that. Nevertheless, Paul here used the same word in the, in the phrase, the law of the Spirit, that previously was applied to the law of Moses. Accordingly, like the law of Moses, there are also rules, regulations, commandments, and ordinances uh, connected with the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, which is the new system of Christianity, the gospel. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also to the Greek. Although it is a law of liberty, deliverance, and freedom from bondage, the requirements of it may not be ignored, but must be observed. Paul wrote of certain persons who were spoken of as without law, that is, without the law of Moses, who were under law towards Christ. Thus, freedom from the law of Moses does not mean freedom from the higher law towards Christ. All people are under obligation, under obligation to obey Christ. Paul calls such obligations the law of Christ in Galatians 6, chapter verse 2. Paul, uh, James called them the perfect law of liberty, James 1, 25, or the royal law, James 2, 8, and the law of liberty, James 2 and 12. Thus, the gospel is a law that men are required to observe and obey upon pain of eternal condemnation if they neglect, refuse, or fail to do so. And you can look at 1 Peter 4, uh, chapter verse 17, and 2 Thessalonians 1st chapter verses 8 and 9. The commandments of Jesus Christ are components of that law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, which Paul mentioned here. Jesus commented on the effects of keeping or not keeping the commandments when he said, whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men to do so, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew, the fifth chapter, verse 19. Now, see, we are at the bottom of the hour, so I'll uh, stop here, and we'll begin with uh, verse 3, chapter 8, next week. Thank you for your kind attention. <laughs>